Good morning. We're in week 12 of our quarantine and we're thankful that you could join us today. I know quarantine has been challenging and the novelty of online worship has worn off a bit, uh, but we're a church without walls and we're gathered together online to honor and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. This service will be quite different than the ones that we've been having for the past 11 weeks. We're going to go off script today and it'll be simplified a bit. I've gone through tremendous lengths to be sensitive to the subject matter that I'm about to talk about and the words in which I talk about it, and even then I may fall short. There was an event in Minneapolis that happened Monday that cannot be ignored. George Floyd, an African-American man, lost his life tragically when a Minneapolis police officer pressed his knee on George's neck to the point where he couldn't breathe, and minutes later he passed away. Please understand that the uh, act of one officer does not represent all police officers. Police departments across this nation have condemned that act by that police officer. And we have wonderful law enforcement officers in our congregation that we appreciate tremendously and honor for their service. But this is about the greater systemic sin of injustice. And as the church, we stand against hatred, racism, abuse of power, and these are things that Jesus was against and came to die for. These are real issues that Jesus dealt with. And therefore, the church needs to deal with this. The church needs to deal with these issues because it exists and it's real. Now, I know this topic can be uncomfortable for, for many of us. For some, it's going to be uncomfortable because it causes a strong, visceral reaction within you. For others, it's going to be uncomfortable because this is very personal. You've experienced being violated in some similar fashion, maybe to a different degree. And for some, it's going to be uncomfortable because you may feel too far removed from the situation or topic. You might feel like this is not relevant for you personally. However, we want to acknowledge all of those emotions today. We want to acknowledge the pain, the sorrow, the anger, the frustration that many of us are feeling. See, because George Floyd's life mattered. He was made in God's image. And there's an endless list of black Americans that we've heard of in the news and those that have gone unreported, that have died nonsensically and inhumanely. They are brothers and sisters who, are, who live in fear every day because of the color of their skin. And as a minority group ourselves, for most of us, we've experienced that ourselves to some degree. And so calling attention to the injustice is the right thing to do. And that's what Jesus did. He confronted the Pharisees about how they were treating the poor and the oppressed. He flipped tables in the temple. So calling our attention to this injustice, I believe, is the right thing to do. And so here's why I want to talk about this today. We can either walk towards our brothers and sisters or we can walk away from them. We can either walk towards our brothers and sisters or we can walk away from them. We're called to love our neighbor. And if you're part of Grace Life community, we want to love God with all of our heart and we want to love our neighbor. And so we can either walk towards our neighbors or we can walk away from them. And for too long, we've walked away. But today, I want to walk towards. And so what is our response as a church to an event that's causing riots and destruction and violence to our entire nation? That's what I would like to talk about this morning to the best of my ability. So would you join me in prayer? Lord, there's a heaviness in many of us. I believe you put that burden in our hearts, but we don't know how to pr process it. Would you awaken us to grow in compassion to a people group outside of our own, just as Jesus and the Apostle Paul did? Our world needs you now. We need you now. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 13, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me.
There is a substantial area of our spiritual formation in theology that we rarely talk about. And I'm talking about a massive omission. It's a large part of our Bible. It's also a large part of life. And it's this concept of lamenting or lament. If you were to do a Google search on lament, it would say, a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. To quote, quote Ryan Williamson, to lament is to cry out to God in our deepest doubts and troubles, all the while fully trusting, fully trusting in his power and provision to deliver us from despair. At 714, uh, we, uh, which is our daily morning prayer time, we're going through the Psalms as our devotions, and we see a vulnerable psalmist, one filled with anguish and despair and pain and suffering, sorrow, depression, and grief. And we notice that he talks about it openly, and he talks about it often. And we've gone through 64 straight psalms, and we'll see that two-thirds of these psalms are actually psalms of lament. And the Bible has dedicated a whole book uh, of lament called Lamentations, which is probably written by the prophet Jeremiah, who was nicknamed the Weeping Prophet. The book of Habakkuk lamented the coming judgment on Israel. However, our culture does not know how to grieve or handle sorrow well. If anything, we try to avoid it, deny it, dismiss it, bury it, or we're numb to it. But if our theology does not embrace or incorporate lament, we're missing out on a powerful connection with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. See, part of the problem, I think, was that I always thought laments were um, towards God was just complaining and rude or insubordinate. I always hated complainers, and I, I def definitely didn't want to be a complainer myself. But Paul Miller in his book, A Praying Life, says, We think laments are disrespectful, but God says the opposite. Lamenting shows you that we are engaged with God in a vibrant living faith because we live in a broken, a deeply broken world. And if the pieces of our world aren't breaking your heart, and if you aren't in God's face about them, then you've just thrown in the towel. And so we see in scripture, we see uh, examples of, of King David lamenting over his own sin, lamenting over the brokenness of this world, uh, we lament over sicknesses and illnesses in our world that we're facing. But culture uh, encourages us and urges us to escape our pain. However, the story of the Bible tells us to embrace our pain and our sorrow and our grief. In the Old Testament, the people of God are no strangers to struggle or hardship. Lament allows us to openly and honestly express the loss we feel to God. Whether it's from a prolonged sickness uh, or a burden of caring for aging parents. Crying out to God uh, allows us to fully process our grief in a space where we are known and loved. A proper lament can ask, why God? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you abandoned me? But a proper lament remembers a God who can be trusted, and therefore we can praise him. And that's what I want us to learn from David's psalm. What do we do with our pain? What do we do with our grief? We lament. We turn to God and we trust in Him. We go through this process because He's taken the worst death, the death of His Son, and redeems the worst to give us victory and hope. And therefore, we know that He is good and that He can be trusted. Here's one more quote from, from Miller. There's no such thing as a lament-free life. To love is to lament. To let your heart be broken by something. If you don't lament over the broken things in this world, then your heart shuts down. Your living, vital relationship dies a slow death. Laments push you back into his presence. And if you don't lament, you miss the resurrection and get stuck in death. And I think that's where many of us may be. We're just stuck in death, that we don't allow ourselves to lament. And what we're missing out is the resurrection power of Christ. Doesn't that reveal even a greater depth of love that God has for us, that he receives and he embraces our lament. I know for me, after a while, I would say, stop your complaining, stop your whining. But God doesn't do that. He embraces our lament. But there is a correct way to lament. It's not just complaining. See, our kids, you know, they complain and they whine and they cry. And after a while, it's like, stop it, stop it. Lament says, I trust you. Don't miss this. Lament is an act of surrender. 
And it's an invitation to go deeper into the Father because he knows your pain. He's experienced your pain to the highest degree. You see, David's saying, yet I will trust you. Jerry Bridges defined trust this way. Trust is not a passive state of mind. It's a vigorous act of the soul by which we choose to lay hold onto the promise of God and cling to them despite the adversity of the time that seeks to overwhelm us. See, lament moves us to a place of anguish, to a place of hope, as we trust that God's provision, justice, and restoration will be in our present and future realities. Even if it's not until eternity, we can trust that one day our God will make things right. Can a brother get an amen? Jesus himself, in fact, lamented, Abba, if it's possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, yours be done. So our African-American community and all those who stand in solidarity with them are in tremendous pain right now. What can we do? The first thing that we can do is we can repent. The outward actions of people is the result of what's in our hearts. And so we need to repent and we need to examine our own hearts and repent of the evil that's in our heart. We need to surrender totally to God. We may not have the outward action of murder, but Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said that if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. And that officer was in a place where what was in his heart manifested. And so you have to ask yourself, is there any hatred? Is there any prejudice? Is there any racism, discrimination in our hearts? So we have to repent. Second, we have to pray. Prayer is not being passive. It's being active against violence, assault, injustice, racism, and oppression. We lament with the others. We weep with those who weep. We mourn with those who mourn. In fact, if you remember uh, 714, it is based off of 2 Chronicles 714, that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, then he will hear our prayers, he will forgive our sin, and he will heal our land. So prayer is an active stand against all of the injustices that we're facing. And finally, we can love our neighbor as ourselves. Galatians 6 talks about carrying each other's burdens, that, and that fulfills the law of Christ. Martin Luther said, to love your neighbor means to bear another's burdens. And we're the body of Christ. And one, when one part of the body hurts, the, the whole body hurts. It, it affects all of us. It hurts the rest of the body. And so when our African-American brothers and sisters are in pain and hurting right now, it should affect us too because we're the body of Christ. Christ came and bore our burdens. Christ came and he loved us when, when we didn't love him. He paid our sin with his blood. And because of this, we can bear one another's burdens also. We carry the burdens of our African-American brothers and sisters. Do we even know what their burdens are? This whole thing shows that we need to take a posture of listening and learning and lamenting. I've reached out to Hope's House Church, uh, which is up the street on Balboa, uh, just a half a mile north of us. And I've, I've expressed our grief and support and our solidarity. And I told them that I, wanted, I want us to take a posture of listening and learning from their sorrow. Well, how do we get, how does King David get from verse 1 to verse 5 and 6? Nearly all of the laments move from negative to positive, from sorrow to joy, from fear to trust. The laments represents the journey of the soul. And in following the examples of the psalmist, we can give ourselves permission to cry out in the midst of our pain. And right now is just a time where we just need to cry out to God on behalf of our brothers and sisters to begin to lament and to grief to begin to just uh, embrace this with, with our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so let's pray together. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, discrimination, and oppression, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. May our ears listen for cries of lament 
and for voices that desire to be heard. Amen. Have a great week, and uh, we're with you in your lament this week. Uh, may you be blessed. We'll see you next Sunday.